Hey Pokemon Masters, Berkey Potobi here, and many people wonder what's inside a Pokeball. It's Blossom, apparently. Many people wonder about what's inside the Pokeball, but very few people seem to ask the question, where did it come from? How old is it? Why is there imagery of the Pokeball stretching back to ancient times in the Pokemon world? That is the question I intend to answer today. Transition into intro. So yes, the Pokeball. Don't get me wrong, there have been theories in the past, and in fact I'm going to be relying on those theories by myself, by OV Curiosities, by Pokemon Insider, and a lot of the old theories and kind of stitching them together, tying them up in a way that really makes sense to me as the, the origins of the Pokeball. But with this theory, I want to start with the newest form of the Pokeball, the modern day Pokeball, just how it looks, a red ball, red top, white bottom. What's going on with it and how long has it been around for? Obviously, the Pokeball doesn't just come in this variant, we've also seen Great Balls, Ultra Balls, and a whole bunch of other Pokeballs that have varying effects. The most recent Pokeball, the most recent kind of Pokeball that appears to have been created within the context of the actual video games, appears in Sun and Moon and Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon as the Beast Ball. This manufactured at the Aether Foundation, again, likely refining the technology of the Pokeball and turning it into something that can catch Ultra Beasts. But where does a modern Pokeball come from? You're all probably pretty familiar with the fourth Pokemon movie in which we see a young Samuel Oak use a kind of altered version of the modern Pokeball. It's like modern Pokeballs in a lot of ways. It's an orb and it opens up and a beam of light comes out. But instead of a button, you've got a little twist motion thing that you use to bring out the Pokemon. And this is a pretty good starting point because young Professor Oak is from 40 years in the past of Ash Ketchum's journey. And while timelines between games and shows don't always like, they don't line up exactly or anything like that, it is still a generally good reference point that somewhere between 40 years ago and modern day as of the games and as of the show, the modern Pokeball in its current form, that's when it was made. In fact, in Pokemon Black and White 2, we get a little uh, memory link with Drayden, the gym leader from Opelucid City. I'm definitely saying the name wrong. The old dragon gym leader who is called Gramps by Iris, and he refers to the fact that Pokeballs didn't exist when he was a kid. And that's totally believable. When you look at the uh, rate of growth of technology, in even in our world, it's exponential. Just think about the mobile phone. It's gone through so many variations over the years, but when I was a kid in like 1996, 1998, phones didn't have screen, they weren't touch screen, they didn't have connectivity to the internet. My first phone was the Nokia 3210, and when I was a child, basically no one I knew had a mobile phone. My parents didn't. You called people on their landline, and all phones had cables, and you had to, if you wanted to use the internet, you had to like not be on the phone. It was a whole thing. The point is Drayden, probably about the same age as Professor Oak, if we go to Drayden as a kid with no modern Pokeballs existing in any way whatsoever, to Professor Oak being just out on his journey as a, like a 10 year old boy, to him having these kind of like clunky Pokeballs, to where we are today, modern Pokeballs. Great, wonderful, there's a timeline. Also not to keep rambling, but as a side note to this theory, uh, in Mustard's League card that is set 50 years ago, on his shorts, in his rare League card, there are, there are Pokeballs. And I've already theorized that Sword and Shield is set far in the future because Opal took over the gym from her mother 70 years ago and Pokemon gyms haven't really been around for 70 years. Which just kind of, side note, low key, again, just helps Sword and Shield is in the future. Anyway, back to Pokeballs. So the next question is, well, where did they come from? And the answer to that seems to be relatively obvious to me. In the Johto games, we meet the character of Kerr, who can hollow out Apricorns and turn them into Pokeballs. He's even known for having a relationship with the GS Ball, which is a very special kind of Pokeball that I, in the past, have theorized as a sort of prototype to the modern Pokeball. And in fact, in Pokemon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, they even refer to the GS standing for Greatest Smith's Ball. The Greatest Smiths. That would be a really good way of describing Kurt. He is a Smith of Pokeball, and he's one of the greatest, one of the original. And actually, Wickstrom appears to be one of those with a bunch of GS balls on his armor. Anyway, these greatest smiths are the last people left alive who know the art of manually creating a Pokeball. And that is because the operations of creating Pokeballs and mash distributing them now lies in the hands of two main corporations in the Pokemon world, Silphco and Devon. These two powerhouse technology advancing companies share a lot in common. 
For one, the Devon Corporation creates warp panel technology, and that can be seen in the Selfco building. Uh, Stephen Stone, the son of Mr. Stone, who runs the Devon Corporation, can be found inside the uh, Selfco head office in Kanto in the Heart God Soul Silver remakes. There's a little bit of ties here, I think. And it would seem to be the case that these companies create the Pokeballs and uh, have Pokeball factories all over the Pokemon world, like the one that we see in the Kalos region. And they just manufacture the item that everyone in the Pokemon world needs. Needs, the Pokeball, which makes them incredibly, incredibly rich. But understanding how these Pokeballs are made are, is really what's going to help us understand where exactly they came from in Pokemon's history. And these Pokeballs are made using Infinity Energy. It's mentioned a lot in Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, and Mr. Stone himself confirms that they use Infinity Energy in the technology, including the warp panels that they give out to the Pokemon world that they sell. And Infinity Energy is just shorthand for the life force of Pokemon. It powers Mega Stones. It was what was fired in the ultimate weapon in Pokemon X and Y. And in Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, while we don't learn too much about it in the Devon Corporation itself, we do learn a lot from Devon's operation at the Sea Marvel. This place is a nature reserve for Pokemon in the oceans of the Hoenn region. It's a lovely place where you can encounter the legendary Hoa or Lugia, you can battle other trainers, but it holds a dark, dark secret. While rummaging around the Sea Marvel, you can find files that basically tell the story that the Sea Marvel was a place that they were using to extract a certain kind of energy to power the New Marvel, which is an underground city that has like a whole bunch of floors, although you can only access the first three or four in the Pokemon games, and that's because the whole project was shut down. It was meant as a sort of utopian escape, should Groudon, Kyogre, Deoxys, Rayquaza, Meteorite, do you know what, just pick your apocalyptic event here, insert it, should an apocalyptic event happen, the new Marvel is there to save the people of Hoenn. A noble idea. But the practices of extracting this energy, the infinity energy, um, were obviously pretty, pretty shady. The whole project got shut back down by the uh, electric gym leader Watson, but notes can still be found in the Sea Marvel showing just how kind of like dark this place was. Here are the 10 tenants, the 10 rules for working at the Sea Marvel. One, say good morning very loudly. Two, don't bring your Pokemon to the workplace. I mean, come on, those two alone. Say good morning very loudly. It's forced, we need to contrive a nice, happy environment. Don't bring your Pokemon to work, though. It could be dangerous. Three, always be on time and always stay late. Four, lay your life on the line for safety checks. Makes sense for a company that's taking the life force of uh, living creatures. Five, take joint responsibility for teamwork. Six, obey your superior's orders, absolutely. That one, number six, is actually very militaristic in nature. Obey your superior's orders, absolutely. You as a worker may not understand why you're doing the dark thing that you're doing, but trust it's just part of the plan. You have to go ahead with it it's for the greater good. The greater good. How can this be for the greater good? Seven, maintain top quality and give up your sanity. Eight, worship and praise the founder. There you go again, number eight, it's insidious. It's like, look, you, you, again, you are too small to see the bigger picture. The founder, the people who set up this project, they understand what we're going for here. Believe in them. It's almost religious in nature. It's almost, in fact, it even says the word worship. You must worship the founder. Six, don't expect time off before you retire. And seven, no need to think, just work unceasingly. Clearly, this is a very strict and hard environment to work in, and clearly they're dealing with some very bigger picture stuff. Again, we're talking about creating a utopia in the new Marvel to save the Pokemon world. And how does this tie into Pokeballs? We're getting to it with the oldest example of Pokeballs that I can possibly think of, the odd keystone. Also in the files, in the notes, you can find out that an odd keystone had been uh, requested from the Obero mine to come and be used here at the Sea Marvel, which is really peculiar until you have a look at what the odd keystone is used for. It's kind of part of Spiritomb's body, and Spiritomb, again, can be found at the Sea Marvel, and it's a Pokemon that, according to its Pokedex entries, came into being when 108 angry spirits were bound to the fissure within the keystone. Also, 108, this, I, the Sea Marvel's on Route 108, so that's pretty cool. But again, the spirits, the life force of Pokemon being bound to an object. And we know, because Mr. Stone says, that they use that same technology, uh, they use Infinity Energy, the life force of Pokemon, to b bind Pokemon 
to the Pokeballs. This is not too dissimilar, and again, there's a theory on my friend Pokemon Insider's channel about how Aura is the same as Infinity Energy, it's just the life force of Pokemon. And we see in ancient times, Sir Aaron, thousands of years ago, summoning Lucario in and out of his staff, just like a Pokeball. And actually, there's a whole number of examples of this. The red and blue orb are from ancient times and they are able to control Pokemon. And we know through Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire that primal infinity energy, that is a big, big part of how those stones operate. Not too dissimilarly, Zekrom and Reshiram kind of retreat into stones when they're, uh, when they're dormant, awaiting the control of a master. We see Jesse in the animated series using a staff with an orb on the end to take control of Pokemon, though this is said to be sound waves, so I don't know if that's the same thing. And in the Arceus and the Jewel of Life movie, we go to the ancient past and we see special armors being used to control Pokemon. And in fact, at that time, Pokemon are called magical creatures and creature masters are the names given to Pokemon trainers. Magical creatures. So in this way, the creation of the Pokeball, it is a blending of magic, aura, spirit, infinity energy, and science. It's a kind of mystery science. And that should give you a hint as to where I'm going now. Because let's say that there have been these relics all throughout time that contain and control Pokemon. In fact, there is an episode that I forgot about where special totems are used to control and, and contain giant Pokemon. Anyway, throughout history, there's been these relics that can contain and control the spirits of these magical creatures, right? And then 500 years ago, according to its Pokedex entry, Spiritomb is bound to the odd keystone. 108 angry spirits. Pokemon are bound to a rock. And that idea is taken forth, and then the modern Pokeball is created from it. And this is represented accurately and completely in the Pokemon Magirna, a literal giant Pokeball that contains the soul heart, a heart of infinity energy. Again, the binding of this mystical energy to a mechanical object. Magirna is the template. Oh, and it's Pokedex entry just like Spiritomb suggests 500 years ago. So there's a specific time frame here. The modern Pokeball came into being around about 40 years ago as of the time of most of the games, though Sword and Shield probably set in the far future. But the idea of the Pokeball and people trying to create a Pokeball probably came about about 500 years ago with the advent of the odd keystone and the, the, the Magirna. The Magirna, just Magirna. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, the events of the war with Sir Aaron were about a thousand years ago, meaning that people had been taming and controlling and becoming uh, magical creature masters for the longest time, for thousands of years. It seems that the relationship between Pokemon and people is pretty symbiotic in the Pokemon world. It's just fundamental to how the world operates. But it seems, as referenced in the movie Arceus and the Jewel of Life, that these people, these, these creature masters, they're a very special kind of person. Perhaps someone who is particularly strong in aura or good at wielding infinity energy can imbue these various objects, these staffs and armors and runes and relics with the ability to control Pokemon. And in fact, the whole of the Pokemon canon really seems to support this idea, apart from, yep, three examples in the animated show. Because why wouldn't the TV show canon try to mess this up? We have at least three examples that I can find. In the episode Battling the Enemy Within, there seems to be something shaped, something designed like a modern day Pokeball that contains the spirit of an ancient king. Now the question is, how ancient is this king? Are they older 500, or did this design come before Magina? If this design did come before Magina, is this the design that inspires what Magina looks like? In the episode Clay Doll Big and Tall, we see a giant stone Pokeball from, yeah, 20,000 years ago, or so the story goes. This could just be myth and rumor, but 20,000 years ago is very, very specific. Though, in the story, the Pokeball does drop out of a wormhole in the sky, so there's no reason to think that this Pokeball couldn't have traveled across time as well as space, so maybe it's from the future. Look, I'm doing my best here to make this whole theory work. In Just Waiting on a Friend, there is Lococo's Pokeball from 200 years ago, and it looks very close to the modern Pokeball. I would say closer than Oak's Pokeball as a kid. And in fact, there's even a statue with the image of the modern Pokeball on it. Perhaps this is just a very popular design and the Oak's Pokeball wasn't part of that design. We do know that the design is at least 500 years old, as seen on Magina, so perhaps there's just like multiple people turning Apricorns into Pokeballs. 
And some of them took this route, and others took the route of Oak's old Pokeball with the twisty handle. It does seem to operate a little bit differently, Lococo's Pokeball. And finally, I said three, I meant four. This is the hardest one to explain. 300 years ago, in ship full of shivers, old Pokeballs and trophies with Pokeballs on them from theoretically 300 years ago. And this is something like, I just, I, I'm pretty sure the modern Pokeball didn't exist until 40 years ago. So why is this here? They got the buttons and everything. All I can assume is that 300 years ago is an exaggeration and perhaps it's like a story that's been passed down and it's a rumor in the local area, but really it's from like 30 or 40 years ago because 300 years ago, this episode makes no sense for that. The whole story from the beginning of time to now, and I actually, I kind of, I, I guess I missed one. The oldest Pokeball is really the Red Chain from uh, Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum. It's the this legendary item that was used to control Dialga and Palkia. That's kind of it, but not really. But essentially, there have always been these devices that those of incredible power or maybe incredibly strong aura or good, with good strong bonds with their Pokemon have been able to use to wield their Pokemon. Sir Aaron's staff, the staff that Jesse had, the armor from the Arceus, movie. Uh, the red chain, as I mentioned. The red and blue orbs, the black and white stones, potentially. These have always existed very few and far between. And then 500 years ago, humans saw 108 spirits get bound to the odd keystone and they went, we need to make that. If we can bind these creatures using their core essence, their infinity energy, to, uh, to a machine, to a stone, then we could control all Pokemon. And so 500 years ago, the mystery science begins and Magina is the first kind of prototype of the Pokeball. Except it went a little bit wrong and the infinity energy just turned it into a Pokemon and it's Magina. And then over the last few hundred years, there's been a couple of variations of Pokemon, Pokeballs, but only the greatest Smiths. People like Kurt have been able to take Apricorns and turn them into the modern Pokeball. And then one day, around about 40 years ago, Silphco and Devon perfected it. They got it exactly right. They bought up all the patents or whatever it is that they did, and they became the biggest industries in the Pokemon world. They're really like the Illuminati of the Pokemon world. And now, of course, using the life force of Pokemon, they control all of these Pokemon with their Pokeballs, and uh, yeah, that's where the modern day Pokeball came from. But that is, of course, just my Pokemon theory. Uh, listen, I got some big announcements coming up. I'm gonna be uploading videos pretty soon about it. I'll talk about it soon, but I'm very, very excited about what is about to happen with this channel and with other channels and things that I'm doing. I've got some merch coming, you'll see it later though. I'm very excited. There's mugs and hats and I haven't stopped wearing the hat really apart from for videos. Anyway, that is it for now. This is my Pokemon theory. Drop me a comment, leave a like, all that jazz. I'll see you with another Pokemon video very, very soon. Thank you very much. And of course, so high Pokemon Masters. This is Ash Ketchum. You just watched a video by Bird Keeper Toby. That makes you a Pokemon Master. A special shout out to those of you supporting this channel on Patreon, including the big patron of the month, Lemon Baby. Thank you, everyone.